This case began in 1982. There was a couple, a young couple, who was murdered in uh, the South Side in Washington Park near a pool. And uh, soon after that, a man named Anthony Porter was arrested in their murder. And Anthony Porter went to trial and was convicted of the murder. Years later, Northwestern University students, working with their professor, were looking at cases they could investigate the potential innocence of murder suspects. And one of these people they started looking at was Anthony Porter. They uh, wound up going to Milwaukee and got a uh, videotape confession from another man admitting guilt in, the, in these murders. The state's attorney's office charged that man released Anthony Porter, and it became international news because Anthony Porter was on death row at the time, and it became one of the driving forces for Governor Ryan to create a moratorium on the death penalty. So years after the fellow who confessed to the murders, attorneys working for him post-conviction started making arguments that uh, he had ineffective counsel and that there was a lot of evidence still against Anthony Porter that was not considered at the time. There's an epidemic in America's criminal justice system. The prosecution and conviction of innocent people for crimes they did not commit. Welcome to the American Justice Podcast. Your hosts, Scott Pogansey and C. Derek Miller, come together to bring you the inside scoop on all of the wrongful conviction stories, both new and old. It's not only about the innocent who have been in prison, but also the victims of crimes as well. No one deserves justice more than them. And now... Here are your hosts, Scott Pogansey and C. Derek Miller. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another edition of the American Justice Podcast. Where we talk shit. And we talk crime. But we, but we never, never talk, talk shitty crime. crime. What's going on, C. Derek? How are oh, you today? Oh, man. Busy, busy, busy. You are too, though. Uh, you know, I think we're all busy. Do, do the lovely people out there know what we did uh, just a few days ago? Uh, I hope they do, but if they don't, why don't you uh, fill them in? Well, I rode in the back seat to Austin while Scott drove and played on my phone. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, I drove and played on your phone, or you no, sat no, in the back you seat? Drove, and... You oh, drove okay. and I played on my phone. I don't know where we went. I wasn't paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you know. I mean, I, would, I didn't kidnap you. <laughs> no, no. Uh, we actually went to Austin to the Capitol building to uh, deliver a petition with, what, 2,500 signatures? About 2,500? Yeah, almost 2,500. To the Court of Criminal Appeals, and it was filed. Scott and Richard Ray marched in there like they knew what they were doing, <laughs> slapped that petition down on the desk and said, do it. Do it, do it now. <laughs> and uh, they did it. And you then, will take our petition. Then we uh, picketed in front of the Capitol buildings with signs, and Scott had a bullhorn, and he yelled at the governor. I yelled at everybody. And uh, the governor rolled after us uh, in his wheelchair, <laughs> and the Benny Hill music was playing. That's and, uh, scary. Then we stuck a stick in his wheels, and he couldn't go anywhere, and that was it. That was the end of the day. <laughs> and wheels was no more. Wheels was no more. No no offense to any handicapped people out there who may be listening. Uh, if, I, if I know you, I would be more than happy to remove the stick from your wheels. <laughs> well, I mean, after the first season, we've been accused of being what? Uh, racist and uh, uh, um, what's it called when you don't like Jewish people? Uh, Anti-Semitic. Nazis? You know, Nazi. Well, (laughs) anti-Semitic and uh, like all kinds of stuff we were accused of being. I I only know a handful of Jewish people and and, (laughs) and I I like them all. There's there's not an abundance of, of, well, you know, there may be an abundance of Jewish people in Texas and I'm just not aware of it because... You know, it is it is Texas, and and if you are what Texans would say is, I'm, I'm doing quotation fingers in the air, <laughs> different, uh, then you have a tendency to hide it in this state because... Um, yeah, there's a lot of people that are not the traditional white Anglo-Saxon Judeo-Christians yeah, that uh, don't feel and, comfortable being It will chain you are. up and drag you behind a pickup. I've seen it. Exactly. Not with my own eyes, but you know the news. <laughs> I, I, Seen the news. That's right. Yeah, that's that's totally a thing. You can Google that. It's free and in your pocket. But you know what? It's getting better. I think. I, I believe it is. It is slowly getting better. Uh, I, Texas came damn close to becoming a blue state during the presidential election, and if we just push a little bit more, I think we can get there. Yeah, that was that was actually pretty historic. That it, it seems like it's getting more and more every time. 
Yeah. So. And we'll, plus we have, uh, what's his name? Beto. Beto O'Rourke. O'Rourke. Yes. Uh, that run the, uh, he won. Oh, he run the, see, I was about. I was he's, a, he's a running. He's a running. Uh, <laughs> he's running for uh, governor yeah. against. Uh, Greg Abbott. Wheels. Wheels. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> with any hope he gets it. Just, uh, I, I'm not sure where he stands on a lot of platforms. I, I know he, uh, he's, he's a liberal dude, and I have a tendency to lean a little more to the liberal side. I'm an independent. You don't say. Yeah, I, I'm an independent. I, I'll always claim that I'm an independent. I have a tendency to lean more toward the liberal side, uh, side of things, though. And, you know, he's, he's right up my alley, and the first thing he wants to do if he gets elected is legalize recreational marijuana in the state of Texas. Yeehaw! And, I support that 100%. I spent a lot of time uh, over the last decade in California, Oregon, Washington, Colorado, places like that. Hadn't changed a damn thing, man. <laughs> right. Hadn't changed a damn thing. You know what it's changed? There are less people in the penitentiary for possession charges of marijuana. Mm -hmm. That's what it has changed. Yep. So well, and they just introduced the bill in Congress to, uh, I think, actually the House passed it to decriminalize marijuana. So. Right, right, and all the Republicans that are fighting it are like, "I don't think you should do this, man." <laughs> so uh, yeah, they're yep. just fighting it for the sake of fighting it. Yeah, but uh, you know, even if the, if they federally legalize it, I still think that Texas would fight it tooth and nail. Well, yeah, and, and you know, it's funny because we're both pretty much independents. We lean a little bit more left, but um, but we also believe that uh, two sane and competent people can come together and compromise on things. Absolutely. And so, you know, that's one of those things where it's like uh, if we just had somebody in the governorship, I guess, that uh, would actually see things and, and independently actually uh, consider – all sides, you know, right. instead of just bowing down to their to their base, then we might actually get some things done here in well, Texas. Well, you know, I mean, if if you don't want to get high, don't smoke it. Don't smoke it. If or or eat it, however you like to do it, you know. Uh, yeah. You know, it's the same thing with a, a lot of other censorship and like film and books. It's it's a big topic right now. Yeah. You know, um, I just I know I know some guys that run a publishing company that were just canceled. Like they they had to shut down. They were just canceled because of. Uh, something that they agreed to publish and about 50% of the fan base in horror without even reading the book, all they read was a synopsis mm -hmm. without even reading the book, uh, just went all off on these guys and were making threats to them on social media. We're even making threats toward their children and they closed their publishing company because of it. Really? Yes. It, absolutely. Absolutely horrible thing. Uh, maybe you should give him a shout out you know or not i don't i don't think it's wise <laughs> okay i don't i don't think it's wise right now um i i'm all because of who i am in my writing career i'm always just teetering on the verge of canceling <laughs> yeah being canceled anyway so uh right. you know okay. let's 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 not do that i'm just i'm just saying you know the book wasn't even released yet i mean they they made this assumption off of a very crappy synopsis and the publisher didn't write the synopsis. The author didn't write the synopsis. It was another guy out of left field who uh, did some contract work for that publisher who wrote that synopsis and obviously did not pay attention to the book when he read it either. So it's a uh, just crazy thing, man. Everybody, everybody is so quick to be right. It doesn't, it doesn't care, you know, what they're, what they're complaining about, man. Everybody just, they rush to the scene, and they have to be right. It must feel good to be right all the time. <laughs> I wouldn't know. Tell, I wouldn't know. I wouldn't know, but they, they can't <laughs> wait to be right. It's like uh, the Next Door app. Right. Uh, you know, there was someone on the Next Door app yesterday morning complaining about a, a clerk at a grocery store in my neighborhood that uh, so a, a customer had, like, dropped some money, and another customer that was in line saw – that clerk pick that money up and tuck it underneath the register. Mm. And they're like, Hey, uh, I dropped my money and you picked it up. And they're like, no, I didn't. Oh no. And so all the customers in the line, like restrained that clerk and went and got the manager. And of course, come to find out the, uh, the clerk did take that money. But my comment on the whole thing was, you know, dishonesty sucks, but so does corporate America. If you pay your people, 
loyalty and honesty will follow. Mm -hmm. And these large corporations don't want to pay their people. And this, this lady, we'll call her Karen for the sake of things. <laughs> it's next door. It's, it's the Karen app. Right. And uh, she, she came back with not all the time. And I'm like, really? Is that the, that's the best, the best you can come back with? <laughs> not all the time. Not every like, single just, one. You were so anxious to be right that mm. you you couldn't even think of an intelligent retort. Right. <laughs> I mean, my God, the world we're living in. That's true. That is true. I'll shut up now. That's okay. <laughs> well, see, Derek, today we're going to bring you another Unique case in this week because, as with snowflakes and fingerprints, no two cases are exactly alike. They are not. Our hero DNA will not be making an appearance this time, unfortunately. Hey, everyone needs a vacation from time to time, right? I do have a few twists and turns for you today, though, so uh, try, try your best not to get whiplash while I tell you the tale. I'll try. No promises. In this episode, we will focus on the wrongful conviction of one Anthony Porter. Whoa, hey, this might be a relative. Or will we? I'm related to a bunch of Porters. Are you? I, I am, as a matter of fact. <laughs> the most famous Porter in my family married uh, Marina Oswald oh, after really? Lee Hart. Well, quotation fingers again, after <laughs> Lee Harvey Oswald killed President Kennedy. That thing's been beat like, yeah, like a dead horse. <laughs> that thing is a... That is true. All right. Well, picture it. Chicago, Illinois, 1982. Do I have to? Do I have to picture I, I don't Chicago? Know, yeah, I don't know if you want to picture Chicago in 1982. One of, but... one of the... Man, one of the worst cities in this country, in my <laughs> personal opinion. I've been there at least 50 times, and every single time was a pain in my butt. <laughs> It's cold, it's rusty, it's stinky. Windy. It's windy. The people are rude. If you go there during football season and you're wearing something other than a Chicago Bears outfit. The Bears. Uh, they will drag you outside and beat you. I mean, it's just... <laughs> Damn. I, I've never had a good time in Chicago. I'm just saying. Well, you know what's funny is I've been to Chicago exactly one time. One more than zero, one less than two. And uh, I had a great time. You know, that's what a lot I, of people uh, say. <laughs> I went to see the Oprah Winfrey show and uh, also went to a Billy Joel concert up there, kind of a little vacation and put them together. And uh, yeah, I, had, I went with a friend of mine and who was actually the brother of an associate producer on the Oprah show. That's how we got into it, because apparently you have to wait like years to go see Oprah, wow. or at least at that time. And, so you don't uh, know which version of Oprah you're getting when you get there. <laughs> well, we all all I know is uh, my friend called up her his uh, sister and said, "Hey, we're going to be up in Chicago at this time. Can we go to see the show?" And she said, "Yeah, come on over." So it was a little. It's, a, it's one of those things, you know. It's like who you know, right? Well, in uh, Chicago, a famous city for its deep dish pizza. Chicago style hot dogs, eh. the Sears Tower. I'll give you that much. And Al Capone. All right, now we're talking. On August 15th of that year, at about 1 a.m., two African American teenagers, Marilyn Green, age 19, and her fiance, Jerry Hillard, age 18, were shot to death in a South Side Park. My mother always said, nothing happened, nothing good happens after midnight. Well, you got here somehow, Scott. <laughs> so, yeah, but I was born at like 5.45 in the evening or something. Yeah, so, but we're know. talking about the conception. Oh, we're not, yeah. We're yeah, not, yeah. Talking, oh, we're not oh, talking about the delivery. I tried not to ask about that. <laughs> William Taylor, who was swimming in the pool at the park when the murders took place, was interviewed by the police. Initially, he said he didn't see who committed the crime. Later, when answering questions at the police station, he said he saw Anthony Porter, a 27-year-old gang member, Run by after the shots rang out. I've got to say, I'd be running in one direction or the other if I just heard shots as well. Running from gunshots doesn't implicate you in a murder. It means you're human. A scared human at that. We'll give you that much. But I guess it's a natural thing to mention to the police, especially if you don't know the names of all the people you might have seen running by at the time. The police needed more to go on. 
So they decided to interrogate Taylor for 17 hours. Yep, that ought to do it. At the end of the 17-hour marathon chat fest, Taylor said he actually saw Anthony Porter shoot Marilyn and Jerry. Do you have a slight twinge of whiplash yet? Well, I mean, if a cop wants to talk to me for seven straight hours, I'm going to make up just about anything for them to leave me alone. Seventeen. Seventeen. Okay, yeah. Seventeen. Oh yeah, yeah. I'm I'm <laughs> I'm making up. I'm a story of Star Wars proportions just to get <laughs> right. out of that interview room. Right. I mean, because you know everybody's met a cop. I'm not saying they're all like this, but for the most part, they're rather dry. Mm-hmm. And. uh yeah, I can't imagine listening to one for 17 hours. Right. I used to remind do it at the Hunt County Sheriff's Department. I used to do it for 40 hours a week, and damn it, if that wasn't more than enough for me. <laughs> it kind of reminds me of the uh, Ryan Ferguson case where Charles Erickson was in the interrogation room after he voluntarily brought himself in and said, I think I, I, think I remember uh, murdering somebody in my dreams. And then they sat there and talked to him for God knows how many hours until it went from you know, I had a dream about it, too. I actually did it. Yeah. No, same thing with the Central Park <laughs> Five. These little kids, yep. they're being interrogated all night long. And yeah, you know what? Just shut the hell up. I did it. Sure. Whatever. <laughs> exactly. And a lot of times, you know, the police, you know, they're allowed to lie to these people. So they can they can tell them, hey, if you just confess, we'll let you go home. And, you know, 17 hours in, uh, you know, everybody says, oh, I would never confess to something I didn't do. But you never know what you're going to do until you're in that situation. Well, what do they say? Home is where you hang your hat. So, uh, you know, right. technically they're not lying. You know, right. yeah, we're going to send you to prison, but you know, you'll you'll, you'll learn to call it home. Right. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, moving on. You wouldn't think it would be a good idea to investigate the victims themselves when searching for clues about who killed them. That's not what we do. You might want to know if they had any enemies, or having any problems, or we're in any sort of trouble. If you were a police officer, you might even interview the victim's family members or friends, right? They might have some useful information having known the victims personally. Well, Marilyn's mother actually got to the police on the right track straight away. She told them, in her opinion, Al Story Simon had committed the murders. She said that Al Story and Jerry had a heated argument over drug money. Oh, boy. And that she saw Al Story with his wife, Inez Jackson, with her daughter and Jerry shortly before the shootings. In my experience, there is nothing good that happens with anybody that have the letters N-E-Z grouped together in their name. <laughs> I thought you were going to say the name Al Story. I was like, that's, that's an interesting Al, Al Story is kind of kind of cool, I guess. <laughs> Never been a big fan of Inez. Inez. Inez's? Uh, uh, no, not not a big fan of Inez's. Hmm. Well, you may be relieved or more likely surprised to hear that the police actually followed up on this lead they obtained from Marilyn's mother by actually interviewing Al Story and Inez. There's that name again. Apparently, they showed them a photograph of Anthony and asked if they had any information that they could share. I That's not the direction I thought they were the questioning would go, but how about you? But of course... Al Story and Inez said they hadn't been in the park that night. And scene. End of interview. Is it that simple? It's that simple. Hey, man, you've been, to, you've been in the park where that guy was killed? No? Okay, bye. Yeah. Uh, sir, do you, know, <laughs> do you know why I pulled you over? Not for speeding. Later. Yeah, the police didn't even ask him any other questions, not even if they had an alibi for the day of the murders. And they never contacted the couple again. You know, if the police need a color by number guidebook called How to Do Police Stuff, I'd be happy to draw something up for them. Isn't there one already though? Like, isn't it like Cops for Dummies or? <laughs> I don't I'm, know. I'm sure there is one. We should, that that would be awesome. Like police the, work for dummies. Yeah, the, or like the police work, like the Cliff's Note, Cliff Notes <laughs> for police work. Well, days later, Al Story and Inez fled the state. I mean, moved to what Milwaukee? That's not There's that far Wisconsin away. Day. It's not. I mean, nothing suspicious about that, right? You get questioned about a murder, and then you just move out of state. <laughs> they they move from one crap city to another, right? Who does that? <laughs> if if you're going to flee, flee somewhere nicer, because chances are you're going to get caught anyway, and you're going to be somewhere worse, <laughs> right? So always flee somewhere nicer. 
uh, on a side note here, I do think Al Story and Inez would make a great romantic book or a movie title. That, not doing it, sorry. Or in keeping with the actual events, they could be a modern day Bonnie and Clyde. You just have to switch out the bank robbery with, you know, drug dealing. As a, uh, as a born and raised resident of the uh, Dallas, Texas area, I find that offensive. <laughs> Nobody could ever be Bonnie and Clyde except Bonnie and Clyde. That's right. All right. Well, I want you to imagine what actions make a person seem guilty and what actions make a person seem more likely to be innocent before I tell you what Anthony did next. I'm sure you've tried to figure out who, quote, done it in any number of crime shows and movies. You've watched and tried to outsmart the misdirection and false clues of the narrative. And by now, I'm sure you're a pro. So... Tell me if this makes Anthony seem guilty or innocent. Upon hearing his name being mentioned in connection with the murders, Anthony went to the police station. Not the one in Milwaukee, in case you were wondering. Does that seem like a choice that a guilty man would make? Not at all. I mean, he's like, hey, I I heard you guys have been talking about me. You know, you've been talking about me and then this whole murder thing like in the same sentence and i'm starting to get a little shaky here i just wanted to come and tell you that yo it's not me no no the real murderer never does that right and and that reminds me of the vincent cosi case where you know he he heard that they were wanting to question him they wanted to ask him some questions so he went down and went down and and well I think the the phrase turned himself in makes him seem guilty, but he do, he went down there just to answer some questions because they had questions. They were yeah. they were looking for him. So he goes down there and says, Yeah, what question, you know, what do you want to ask me? Yeah, I heard that one of your guys told my mama last night that if I didn't do this, <laughs> there was a chance that you guys were going to shoot me Accidentally in the Accidentally shoot me. So right. I'm here. <laughs> and that and that was Milwaukee. So don't that was well. It was right outside of Milwaukee. Same right. thing. Don't right. flee till Milwaukee. <laughs> right. Well, talk about walking into the lion's den. Anthony told the police he was innocent. They had no physical evidence that connected him to the murders. How does this part of the story unfold? Anthony was arrested and charged with two counts of murder, one count of armed robbery, one count of unlawful restraint, and two counts of unlawful use of weapons because. You know, it's unlawful to use weapons to murder somebody. Okay, no, wait a minute. This this guy, <laughs> like, basically, he was running from gunshots, and he got right. he got accused of all of that right. in in the period of running from the park. Right, because he heard gunshots and decided to get the f out of there. Damn, he must have had a coupon, man. He got charged with a lot. <laughs> right, and no, I don't know how the police went from a lack of physical evidence to an abundance of criminal charges i know my guess would be shoddy police work what's yours uh my my guess is find a suspect that you can build your case around right because that is the answer to every single damn episode of the american justice podcast we've ever done right don't do any police work don't look don't look for evidence or a real suspect just find a potential suspect who may or may not be intelligent enough to get his way out of there right. and then build your case around it right he he has no there you know they have no other suspects so all they have is this one person that says i think i saw that one guy yeah well, you know, this this you guy know. he's not he's not the smartest fella in the whole wide world he's uh you know he, i don't think he can afford a good attorney Let's do him. Right. You know, I really need to get working on that police guidebook. It's It'd be worth its weight in gold, and I plan to make it super heavy. Uh, most of them won't even bother picking it up. <laughs> right. Unless you shape it like a donut and you put sprinkles on the cover, most of them won't even pick it up. Right. <laughs> Your Stories on Video is the perfect service to preserve all of your memories for generations to come. If you've ever thought to yourself that it's time to get all of those precious memories down on video, now is the time. Here's a quick sample of one of our videos. My name is Daryl Kaiser, and and, uh, I was uh, born uh, in 1925 in uh, Canby, Minnesota. The happiest day of my life. It has to be when I got married. 
Yeah, that, that would have to be my happiest day. I uh, sat down in a, in, a, in a chair that was several chairs, and there was women on the opposite side. And I looked, a guy ordered me a drink, and I, and I looked down that way, and, and Betty was looking at me. <laughs> So I winked at her. <laughs> and uh, the next thing I know, I, you know, was just, uh, then I went and asked her for a dance, and we we danced and and uh, so several times, and and uh, and then I asked to take her home. I can't say that I ever gets out of my mind at all. Daryl hired your stories on video because he wants his grandkids and their grandkids to hear from his own mouth and his own likeness what his life was like. He also shared the family ancestry as only he could. Going back and researching archives are one thing, but watching the person that lived it is so much better. The process to get a video is very simple. Just go to www.yourstoriesonvideo.com and request a consultation. Then one of our experienced story consultants will work with you from the beginning to the end to make sure your video is exactly what you want it to be. Many kinds of individuals and families utilize our service, from the older generation wanting to pass down their wisdom to those that have an unfortunate medical diagnosis. Contact Your Stories on Video today at yourstoriesonvideo.com. Mention the American Justice Podcast and receive a 25% discount. Well, Anthony qualified for a public defender, but his family hired a private lawyer. Good for you, Anthony. Yes, very good. If I haven't said it before, I should have. So I'll say it now. It is usually your best bet to put your resources into a good attorney for the first trial. Getting an innocent person out of prison after the verdict is so much harder and is usually much more costly. So Anthony's family did the right thing, in theory. The lawyer's name was Akeem Gersell. What in the hell? And his fee was $10,000, $3,000 of which was paid at the beginning of the trial. Presiding over the case was Judge Robert L. Sklodowsky. Here we go with the names. Here we go. I know. Hey man, I'm I'm I've been doing my uh my tongue twisters, so I've been practicing. Sally says, says she sells size. Uh, Peter, All you yeah. Sladowskis and Gersells and Pogansies. <laughs> I know. I'm just over here chilling with a Miller. That's right, you lucky dog. William Taylor's testimony was the focus of the prosecution's case. You remember William, right? He's the one who gave that mild whiplash I warned you about. I'm guessing the police felt that. They had worn him down sufficiently enough to carry their entire case for them. As for the defense, Gersell fell asleep at one point <laughs> during the trial and only called two alibi witnesses and one photographer who had been taking pictures in the park. I guess $10,000 doesn't go as far as it used to. Sorry, guys. I didn't mean to fall asleep. We had a late night last night at the firm. Went to Dave and Buster's, you know. And all this legal stuff is yeah. boring. All this legal stuff is boring. <laughs> and that's pretty much all there is to tell about this short trial. The jury came back with a guilty verdict, and the judge sentenced him to death, referring to him as a perverse shark. Anthony appealed, but to no avail. He could delay his fate, but he could not prevent it. He had a date with the executioner. His family had already made the funeral arrangements. That just makes me shudder, let me tell you. And then, late in 1998, just 50 hours, and by some accounts just 48 hours, before Anthony was set to be executed, the Illinois Supreme Court granted him a reprieve. Why are, wow. these, yeah, why are these things always so close? Can well, someone please figure out how to get their legal ducks in a row in a more timely maybe manner? Maybe it's like, wait a minute, this guy's not a perverse shark. You know who a perverse shark is? That that Jaws guy. <laughs> the first movie opens up and he eats a naked chick. <laughs> That's a perverse shark. Yes. So if you're thinking that the court acted out of concern for Anthony's innocence, don't get too excited. He had scored a 51 on an IQ test. Anything below 70 is considered to be low. 
and they wanted to be sure that he was able to understand his situation and what his punishment ultimately meant. In any case, I'll take any reprieve where I can get one. I'm sure if they could, Walmart would sell reprieves on the clearance aisle at each of their 11,501 locations worldwide, and people would stand in line for hours to buy their fair share. See, I slipped in that fun fact about the number of Walmart stores as a kind of reprieve from the tension of Anthony's story. See, You're I welcome. Can, I can slip in a Walmart fact, actually, Uh-oh. that many people do not know. Okay. Because as you know, I spent a decade of my life in the fine art industry. I do. And every year, the Walton family goes to the Miami Art Fair, a.k.a. Art Basel Miami, which is like the sister art fair to Art Basel in, I believe, Sweden or Finland or one of those countries that I don't care about. (laughs) (laughs) And they buy millions upon millions of dollars in art every year. And they hide it as equity in a warehouse in Arkansas that is owned by a moving company. Hmm. But they can't pay their employees right. worth a crap. And they can't give them benefits. They can't do any of that. But they can hide their wealth in art. Crappy art at that. <laughs> but expensive crappy well, art. Well, yeah. When, you're, when you got that kind of money, you don't really need and they, to. they hide it in a warehouse in Arkansas. I've been there. Mm. I've seen it. Nice. Dry land is not a myth. I've seen it. <laughs> that's your Walmart fact for me. That's that's good to know. Isn't, the, isn't one of the uh, Walton people trying to buy the Denver Broncos right now? I don't know. I just I know that probably that. one of those Walmartians is going to be knocking on my door after they hear this. <laughs> Walmartians. <I like> it. <laughs> so while you're busy looking one way to see if Anthony has a high enough IQ to understand what's happening to him, I'm going to ask you to look another way. And just like that, you have to be careful about that whiplash again. Anthony's fate was sealed. His doom was set. The funeral arrangements were made. And then, as serendipity would have it, the reprieve granted by the court gave a certain journalism professor precious time to look into the case. Professor David Protess of the Medill School of Journalism at Northwestern University along with a team of his journalism students and a PI named Paul Cialano, decided to reinvestigate the facts. What transpired next is something you might only see in an almost too-good-to-be-true episode of Law & Order. You might even think that this kind of episode was a bit, quote, too easy and therefore a tad bit unbelievable, or possibly totally bogus. I'll tell you how things unfolded, but don't get too attached to the narrative. It may change on you. Whiplash episode, remember? Do you think that somewhere 20, 30 years from now, if podcasts are still a thing, somebody else doing a true crime podcast will be like, and then this PI and this shitty horror (laughs) author looked into Brandon Woodruff's case. And (laughs) I certainly hope so. Yeah. Well, in December of 1998, the prosecution star witness, William Taylor, recanted his testimony to Paul Cialano and one of the students. He signed an affidavit stating that the police, quote, threatened, harassed, and intimidated him into naming Anthony as the shooter. Of course they did. You don't say. Because you pick a person that you know is uh, three donuts shy of a full dozen. We're going to use cop terms in this episode. (laughs) Three donuts shy of a full dozen, and then build your case around them. That's right. Well, on January 29th of 1999, Professor Protess, Mr. Cialano, and two of the students talked to Inez Jackson. That damn name. Your favorite person. Nope. Who was by then estranged from Al Story Simon. Aw. I thought those two crazy kids could make it work. Absolutely not. <laughs> you, two people experiencing gunfire in a park. You think that would be enough to keep them together forever. <laughs> right. Well, she claimed she saw witnesses of the shooting of Marilyn Green and Jerry Hillard. Wait, you mean the one answer she gave to the police about not being in the park that day of the crime was a lie? Inconceivable. Well, who do you think she said she saw pull the trigger? Yep, you guessed it. None other than Al Story Simon, her ex. (laughs) Mm -hmm. It's always the ex. I guess he lied to the police about being in the park too. What is this world coming to? 
She went on to say that she didn't know Anthony and that he had nothing to do with the murders. Her nephew, Walter Jackson, corroborated her story. Apparently, Al's story fled to Walter's apartment after the shooting. On February 3rd of 1999, are you ready for this? I'm going to wrap this case up in a nice, neat bow for you. Allegedly, four short days after Inez made her statement, what? <laughs> I just said that. Oh. It's a name, man. <laughs> I know. <knows. laughs> Al Story Simon confessed on videotape to Cialano. He said he killed Jerry Hillard in self defense after arguing about drug money. He said Marilyn Green was shot and killed accidentally. Oops. Collateral damage. Yeah. Who would have expected three key players in this case would all fess up to the same crime? You look one way and you see a death sentence. Look another. And you find a shiny new version of the truth. And all this mixed with the suspense and drama of an 11th hour reprieve. You just can't make this stuff up, folks. No, you totally can. People, <laughs> people make this up every day. All the time. But mostly they just find someone who's done it before and just reboot it. Right. And they're just like, and a lot of those are based on true stories. In February of 1999, prosecutors accepted the legitimacy of Al Story's confession, and Anthony was set free. In March, the charges were dismissed. Anthony had spent 17 years not just in prison, but on death row. That's a long time spent literally knowing that each day could be your last. Oh my God, and that means that he was locked up through the majority of the 80s. Mm -hmm. And the 90s, you think about how much the world changed between the 70s and the 2000s. Right. And what all he missed out on. And, oh, my God, he missed ALF. I know. That, like, <laughs> Actually, uh, no, they, have they have televisions in I prison. I kill me. I don't know if they have televisions on death row. If they have televisions in prison. <laughs> but but still, just life, 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 man. That's That's the two decades that you and I... Did the most growing up in. That's true. And he missed out on all of that. Well, speak oh, for yourself. I still haven't grown up. Oh, please tell me he got <laughs> lots and lots of money. Well, we'll talk about that here. Uh, we'll talk about that right now. Governor George H. Ryan granted him a pardon based on innocence, which exonerated Anthony and erased his conviction. To free a wrongfully convicted man 48 hours away from being executed has got to be the great dream of any reporter anywhere. There was one problem, though. It was one big lie. A bunch of kids who had taken a course on journalism dug up the information that was there available to the police. We went and we reenacted the crime, and we found out that the eyewitness couldn't have seen it at all. They were heroes. The case was a pivotal moment in the abolition of the death penalty in Illinois. I'm commuting the sentence of all death row inmates. I said, there's something going on, but what's going on is not what you see on TV. The journalism professor intentionally leaves out the most important fact of all. They seized on the name of a guy with no evidence and concluded he was the real killer. He tells me that a man is getting ready to die for something I did. She told us that she had been there when her husband committed the crime. I heard two gunshots. Totally inconsistent. The victims were shot five times. How many shots did you hear? Really three, maybe four. I don't know. This case had a motive behind it bigger than the crime. I was in the wrong place at the wrong time. These guys are saying they'll help me get out of prison. They'll say whatever they want me to say. We got the right guy. Anthony Porter killed those two people. It's an utter outrage. It's justice upside down. What would make this right is my freedom. In 2000, the Illinois Court of Claims awarded him, are you ready? Drum roll. $145,875.29. and that's it? Really? 29 you can't, you can't cents? buy a drum for that to do a drum roll. <laughs> right. I know they must have some magic formula to compute these figures, but that's just insulting. You know, by that time, and I'm going to do my own math at this point, the award comes to $8,580.90 for each year 
that Anthony spent in prison. The United States Department of Health and Human Services poverty guidelines show that if you made below $8,350 in the year 2000, you were earning poverty-level wages. And probably working for Walmart. I'm not going to get off of them (laughs) in this episode. I just want them to know that. Please don't send one of your Walmartians to my door to probe me. (laughs) Did the Court of Claims determine Anthony wasn't bright enough to earn more than poverty-level wages? Who knows what his potential might have been, or who might have lent him a helping hand and he not been wrongfully convicted? For example, Walmart would have almost certainly given Anthony a job, a steady job, no matter what his mental capacity might have been. Look at that, two or even more Walmart facts in one episode. What a red line special. In 2003, Anthony sued the city of Chicago for $24 million. The city refused to settle and the case went to trial two years later. The jury decided against him. And he lost an appeal. In September of 1999, Al Story pled guilty to second-degree murder, (laughs) defined as intentional murder that lacks premeditation, and involuntary manslaughter, defined as an unintentional killing resulting from a criminal negligence or recklessness. What a weight off his mind, huh? I mean, how terrible it must have been to have spent 17 years with a guilty conscience out there in the fresh air, suffering no consequences of any kind. And probably making more than $8,000 a year. (laughs) Oh, I'm sorry. I meant to say how terrible it must have been for Anthony to have spent 17 years on death row for a crime that he did not commit. Sorry, what was I thinking? Either my empathy meter was off or my sarcasm button was on full blast. Tell us more about the button, Scott. Uh, You know you like the button. (laughs) I love the button. During Al Story's reportedly emotional hearing... He apologized to the families of the victims. I know that forgiveness is supposed to help the wronged person even more than the offender, but I think I would find it hard to accept his apology at first. Nah, probably ever. Just being honest here, Al's story was sentenced to 37 and a half years in prison. But not on death row. Not death row, exactly. Are you freaking kidding me? This this is why... This is why I think the entire country should do what Texas just did and become constitutional carry. So little old ladies on the courthouse step can shoot people like this. <laughs> you know, just I just my opinion. I just found out, you know, there's actually 26 states that have constitutional carry. I really? thought Texas was like a trailblazer. But yeah, no, we're that's like that's, fi- uh, you know, more than half. Yeah, it's 51 <laughs> percent. I mean, and, that's that's better. That's better than our current president's approval rating. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Love you, Joe. But come on, man. Right. Come on. And now for another round of whiplash. I'm going to pivot away from Anthony's case and dive deeper into Al Story's case. Who would have thought that there would possibly be more to his story? Aren't you glad I didn't say Al's story? <laughs> Get it? Al's story. Al's I thought you was going to say, aren't you glad I didn't say banana? <laughs> <laughs> moving on. Moving on. All right. <laughs> In December of 2005, a little more than six years after Al Story's trial, his lawyers filed a post-conviction petition with the aim of vacating his conviction. <laughs> you got to be kidding no, me. No, this is crazy. Shit, shit cago. <laughs> what in the fresh nonsense is this? Al, I mean, all I can call him is Al. Well, Al claimed he was coerced by Mr. Cialano to falsely confess to the murders an accusation that Cialano denied. On top of Al Story's claim of coercion was the fact that Inez Jackson, who was very ill and on her deathbed at the time, recanted her statement about being there when Al Story shot the two teens. Walter Jackson, who you may remember, also told the journalism students that he witnessed Al Story pulling the trigger, recanted his story as well. Wow. The two said that they made up the stories to get money and assistance from Professor Protes, hoping he could help freeze Inez's son. Free, not freeze. <laughs> freeze. You got to freeze Fre- Inez's son. Freeze my son, please. <clears throat> the two said that they made up their stories to get money and assistance from Professor Protest, hoping that he could help free Inez's son, Sonny Jackson, and her nephew, Walter, from prison. Walter was incarcerated for first-degree murder, in case you were wondering. 
Has anyone forgotten that Al Story himself confessed and apologized to the victims' families? Well, apparently there's an explanation for that. According to Al Story's lawyer, Jack Rimland... Oh, that sounds like an amusement park I wouldn't want to go to. <laughs> ...pressured him to plead guilty even though he was innocent. Aw, I bet it sucks to be an innocent man in prison. Poor guy. Oh, wait, am I being too callous? I just don't know who to believe anymore. Counterpoint, according to Mr. Rimland, Al Story admitted to him and another attorney that he committed the murders. Gotta love it when your attorney turns on you. I think I'm going to need a neck brace now, and I'm truly feeling both cynical and skeptical at this point. Was Anthony innocent? Was Al Story innocent? Was there anyone left who didn't recant their stories? Oh, but there's more. Oh, let me guess. The police shot the guy <laughs> and then blamed and then it on these other blamed people. Blamed it on the other citizens. People. Just, I, I didn't shoot him. You did. <laughs> I'm not crying. You are. In May of 2006, another witness came forward with something to say. Raymond Brown. Oh, look at that. A, 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 norm, a normal a, name. A normal name. Who was just 13 years old at the time of the murders, said that he was in the park, heard gunshots, saw Anthony shoot a gun, and saw Jerry Hillard lying in the bleachers. He said he saw Anthony run past him, holding a gun. Where was this kid hiding back in the day? What would he have said at the time of the murders if he had been interviewed then? Whatever it was, he'd probably recant it at some point. Anyway, we'd be no closer to knowing the truth. I think McDonald's was just giving out guns and Happy Meals in the 80s in Chicago. That's a very good possibility. Anyway, Al Story's post-conviction petition was denied in September of 2006, but in October of 2013, Al Story's case was referred to the Conviction Integrity Unit, and on October 30th, a motion was filed to vacate Al Story's conviction. The motion was granted. The charges were dismissed. Al Story became a free man after spending 15 years in prison. The logic behind this development? Cook County State's Attorney Anita Alvarez asserted Al Story falsely confessed because of tactics used by Professor Protest and P.I. C.L. Nano. Those two sound like they need their own TV show. That does sound like an interesting show. But what could that mean? Reportedly, Cialano and another man posed as police officers, <laughs> and the professor and his team made a video that included an actor pretending to be an eyewitness who said Al's story was the murderer. They allegedly promised him a short prison sentence and a movie deal if he confessed. And confess he did. Who? This... <laughs> No, this people say all the time, oh, you just you can't make this stuff up. And people are like, yeah, you can. No, I make stuff up for a living. You can't make that up. <laughs> the PI, the PI and the and the professor come with a, an actor that says oh he saw. God. That's awesome. Chicago. Yeah, exactly. If this claim is true, it would be a clear violation of Al Story's rights. Protests and Cialano adamantly denied any wrongdoing. The professor was suspended by Northwestern University in 2011 due to the controversy, and later he resigned. Given all the complications and contradictions in this case, my wrongful conviction spidey sense is starting to tingle again. But I just can't shake the apology to the victim's families during the trial. That seems more likely to have been heartfelt and guilt-inspired than to have been coerced. Honestly, I feel like the victims didn't get justice, and we are all left unsure about how exactly and who exactly pulled the trigger. The case remains unsolved to this day. Well, why don't they just do what they did in the first place? Is just pick a random person off the street and build the case around them. And congratulations, there's your suspect. Exactly. And we'll find some witnesses that say that they saw him. Sure. Them. And we'll, <laughs> we'll get a, we'll get a uh, motion picture team out there, and we'll, we'll get you a movie deal. So, yep, okay. Exactly. In 2015, Al Story filed a suit against Northwestern University's Innocence Project. He was awarded an undisclosed settlement three years later. He also requested. Was it more than $8,000? Undisclosed. <laughs> he also requested a certificate of innocence in 2015, which a judge. 
denied. And now he has an empty space on his refrigerator. He bought those <laughs> magnets right. for nothing. I was convicted of a crime I didn't convict. I'm going to put it right here next to this house I colored <laughs> and this, the, with the blue duck. In July of last year, Anthony Porter passed away at the age of 66, just over seven years after being released from prison. The medical examiner ruled his death was an accident caused by an anoxic brain injury due to probable opioid toxicity. That happens. In the year 2000, after intense pressure from the public and the media in regard to other wrongful convictions brought to light by the Northwestern University Innocence Project, a review of the state's cases was ordered by Governor Ryan. On July 11, 2003, the governor commuted the death row sentences of all 167 inmates to life in prison and pardoned four others. As recently as 2011, the state legislature passed a law abolishing the death penalty. It was signed into law by Governor Pat Quinn. At least something positive came out of this tragic case. That's, that's true. That's true. If you manage to get through this episode with your neck muscles intact, you may be interested in viewing a 2014 documentary on the case called A Murder in the Park, available now on Amazon for rent for $3.99, or you can buy it for $12.99. I know it by its other name called uh, Typical Chicago Tuesday. <laughs> well, here's a spoiler alert. The documentary supports the original conviction of Anthony Porter, and contends that Al's story was wrongfully convicted. Oh, wow. So how many wrongful conviction cases have we covered by this episode? One, two, zero. I'm sorry if you're disappointed in the uncertainty of the outcome today. As for me, I'm just left haunted by the fact that Marilyn and Jerry will take the identity of their killer to their graves. They still live in Chicago, probably? So uh, No, I are... think they're dead. Oh, are they dead already? <laughs> <laughs> Jerry and Marilyn were the ones that were killed. Oh, well, <laughs> they're, they're <t> <laughs> well. There's so many. There's so many names here. I'm like, who, who's this person? Who's that person? Yeah, just, <laughs> just I, I, oh, I was gonna make a uh, random gunfire in Chicago joke, but you just screwed that up, Scott. <laughs> Sorry. I mean, you know. <laughs> Anyway, bullets just fall down in the city of Chicago like rainfall. <laughs> so you're going to get hit by one eventually. All right, so we have any uh, thoughts on this episode? I'm going to blame Putin. He's a very popular person to blame things on these days. Absolutely. He did it. You know, I think that this is um, this is just one of those cases where it's like we we may and probably will never know what uh, what actually happened. But, you know, it is, it is interesting, though, that... Uh, Al story, you know, apologize to the family. I think that's one. If I was convinced to take a guilty plea in promises of a short sentence and a and a book deal, I would think that I would just go in, confess, be done with it, and that's it. You know, I wouldn't apologize to the family and all that. Yeah, stuff. Yeah, that's kind so, of an extra step, right? So, you know, if if I was innocent, wrongfully convicted, and I got out, you know, I'm I'm not apologizing. Screw you, family. Right. I'm not. I didn't do anything. I'm not apologizing to you. So exactly. All right. Well, that's going to do it for another episode of the American Justice Podcast. Thank you guys so much for listening. Our uh, our listener base is growing every day, and we are enjoying so much bringing this to you. And glad that you like it. I I, I know. Uh, I didn't think I was, uh, you know, able to to do such good in the world. <laughs> yet yet here I sit, enter, entertaining the masses, and uh, hopefully leading, you know, the, the people, the people with the money and the power and the everything to change the outcome of some of these cases, to uh, you know, point them in the right direction. One silly joke and one Walmart <laughs> curse at a time. That's right. All right, everyone. Well, again, thank you for listening to the American Justice Podcast. Until next time, remember to stay aware, stay strong, and get involved. See, See you next, next time. The American Justice Podcast is owned and copyrighted by Atua Productions, LLC of Dallas, Texas. Your hosts are Scott Pogansey and C. Derek Miller. Atua Productions aims for this to be an interactive podcast where you, the audience, has a great amount of influence on the content of our shows. You can interact with us in several ways. 
first and most preferred is you can leave us a voicemail. Our phone number is 972-942-0444. Be sure to leave your name and city you're calling from, along with whether or not we can use your voice on the air. If Facebook is more your style, you can log on to our Facebook page at facebook.com slash American Justice Podcast. Feel free to leave a comment, or you can message us on Messenger if you have a more pressing question or issue. If you'd like to blog about the show, you can log on to AmericanJusticePodcast.com and let us know what you think there. If you're a tweeter, you can also voice your opinion on Twitter at A Justice Podcast. We would very much appreciate it if you could give us a five-star review on all the podcast streaming platforms. 